can't call them patients because they're not really patients. We can't call them clients because they're not really clients. So we come up with recoveries and participants. Right. And I just call them people. Yeah. Hey, this is Richard Zombeck, and you're listening to Buds with Suds. Don't forget, you can find us on iTunes, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. In this episode, I've got Mike Cochran. He is a recovery coach at Elliott and uh, North Shore ACCS. Uh, he is CARC certified. He's a little bit older than me. Uh, we had a pretty good conversation about some of the learning collaboratives that BSAS is running. Uh, Tito Rodriguez, who was on a previous episode, and I are doing these learning collaboratives on the North Shore. Uh, our first one was on wellness plans. Uh, Mike was there. And the last one was on how we measure success and Mike and I got into that a little bit in this episode. So I'm not going to make you wait any longer. Here's the episode. Uh, Mike Cochran, welcome to uh, Buds with Suds. Thank you. It's good to be here. So you're, um, I'm trying to think what you are. You're a recovery coach with Elliot. I am, yes. I'm, uh, I'm a hybrid of a lot of things. I, I was a kitchen designer by trade, actually. Really? Yeah. And then um, got sober. Knock on wood, we stay that way. Um, took uh, Howie Silvetsky's curriculum up at North Shore Community College. How long? How long ago was that that you that you got sober? Um, I got sober in two thousand and six, so almost thirteen years in January. Oh, so right, right before me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it, is that, I got yeah. almost fourteen years in January. I'll have to ask my ex-wife. She's the one yeah, that gives me, I got, she gives me my chip every year. Yeah, because I got sober <laughs> in 2007, January 2007. So it was the, the very beginning of 2007. So I'm, I was I'm coming Janu up on January years. 18th, 2006. So you're coming up on 14 years. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, no kidding, right? I know. Almost, almost through the lucky 13. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I mean, that's I, I always think it's kind of... Um, it's a pretty... I don't, I don't want to say good indication, but it's an, an indication... Of where people are at when they forget how long they've yeah they've, absolutely they've been, they've been doing it stop counting the anniversaries you know, when it doesn't doesn't matter anymore going on the speaking tour and, right. yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. Right. I was uh, I don't know if you heard the 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 show with uh, Tito Rodriguez I did but he, he was he was a little uh, um, let's say beside himself about people talking about being in long term recovery and they've got like three months yeah you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like because like, because I, I kind of came up in the same kind of way of it's like you know you start saying that when you've got like twenty years yeah absolutely you know, I, I don't consider myself an old timer by any stretch yeah of I don't I don't either I I still think I'm brand new and I I used to um I well, I still go to groups that say uh, you're a newcomer for the first ten years yeah you know yeah. so so anyway back to you and um so kitchen designer and then got sober in 2006 yeah um, and what what was your what was your thing just for the i mean we talked a little bit about it before the it, mics came in on, the but. end it was booze but i mean you know i did everything i went in the service right out of high school and it was just a few years after vietnam it was like 6 years after we got out of saigon so we're talking 78 i went in december of 78 and uh, as you can well imagine there was a lot of good <laughs> there did my first detox in the service, as a matter of fact. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, were, were you overseas or? Nope. Nope. Okay. Never got a chance to get there because um, back then the service was dying to get people. So they'd promise you anything and they would take anybody. And I was amongst those would take anybody people. <laughs> <laughs> and at 17 years old, away from home with no, with no guidance, I mean, my Sergeant in basic was my guidance, and, you know, I just went hog wild. Yeah, so where, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Danvers. I'm a North Shore guy. I grew up running Danvers and Peabody and Salem and Beverly and Marblehead, Swampscott. Okay. And what, you, you, you started drinking? Oh, cripes. I remember taking my first sip when I was a kid. My parents would have a party, and my father had one of those little metal jiggers that he used to mix drinks, and... I'd wake up in the morning and I'd go to get breakfast and I'd smell that thing in the sink and I'd think to myself at six years old, seven years old, boy, that smells pretty good. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that was probably the first time I really tried it, but I started drinking when I was 11, 
you know, started smoking weed immediately. I really want to try to figure that out because everyone's like 11 to 13. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of at the time it was the, it was the landscape, I guess, if you will. I mean, the ice cream man was selling weed off the ice cream truck and, you know, things were, things were pretty much out in the open and people didn't think much about it. Um, if you got caught drinking when you were 13 or 14 years old, it was just like, oh, he's just sowing his wild oats. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, know. it was the same thing with DUIs, right? So, right, right, absolutely. Yeah. I remember see, the see, first time. Uh, just get I home. Gotta, I got a ride. I got a ride. Yeah, just get home or you yeah. get a ride home. Yeah. Or, yeah, pick up your car tomorrow. Yeah. Or try I'll, to drive slowly. We'll follow you. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've only actually had one DUI, which I got back in like 1983, but I probably should have had four or five before that. I was just getting out of high school. Yeah, I got out of high school <laughs> in seventy nine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're not we're not that far apart. Nope. Nope. So so you said the the you, you mentioned the curriculum before. You said, uh, let's go back to that. Uh, um, so after I was about, I think I was about five years sober, and you know I just wasn't feeling the. The corporate world and the the kitchen design. I actually found out once I got sober that I actually hated what I was doing, and didn't really wasn't able to put my heart into it. Um, and so I decided, you know, I'll I'll go back to school because I haven't been in school since 1979. So let's give it a let's give it a whirl. And it just seemed natural that you know I was going to meetings every day, twice a day, sometimes um, that I would, you know try on the the substance abuse counselor program that they had at North Shore. So was that the the 18 month uh, associates? Yeah, yeah, I did the certificate program so it was I actually finished it in one full year and a semester because I went started in the fall, went right through the winter, summer and uh got out in the winter of 2011. Okay. Um and I went to, I had Steve Chisholm was, he's the, uh, yeah, yeah. he's got the program up there now, but at the time he was vice president of quality control at Cab Cab Health and Recovery Services. Okay, yeah, no, I know Steve well. Yeah. yeah In yeah. fact, I'm trying to get him on the show. He's talking about maybe this month or next I'll, month. I'll, so. I'll talk to him. We'll see if we can twist his arm for Oh, I, I've been twisting it just fine. So yeah. he, he's agreed. It's just a question of, of uh, getting the time. He, he's an awesome guy. Yeah, he really is. He's really good. If I, I'm gonna have to cut out his laugh, but aside from that, we should we should be okay. <laughs> you let him sit. You let him sit Lotus position right here in the middle of the table, and he's gonna be fine. Yeah, exactly. So you you completed that. Um, you got the certificate, and and then what? Uh, well, it was his suggestion that you know he he thinks working in a detox should be basic training for anybody that wants to be in the business, and uh, so I went and got a job at Cabin Damaris. Um, and he was right. That was like, that couldn't have been a more perfect starting point for me. Um, why do you Why do you think that is? You know what? You're seeing people at their absolute worst, and you're going to learn pretty quickly whether you can deal with people like that and maintain some empathy for how they're feeling, um, as opposed to just you know saying you know this this is bullshit. Yeah. And um, and could could you? I could. You know, thanks to some good people that I was working with. There were some really great people working there at the time, and I um, I was ready to walk after, like, my second day. <laughs> I was ready to walk right out of there, but um, I worked with a couple of people that, you know, talked to me and kind of showed me the ropes and showed me around and how things work, and, you know, it just got better and better and better. So you've been you've been doing you've been doing this now for about eight years then, right? Yeah, eight I nine mean, years. Yeah, di- on different different uh, venues and and areas. Yeah, well, by design, I've I've worked in a lot of places. I mean, a lot of places. Um, I started at Cab. I went from Cab to the Boston Public Health Commission. Uh, from there, I went to work for Caspar doing outreach at the shelter. Um, from Caspar to MGH Boston, I was the first recovery coach on the ground there. Uh, me and me and Bougie, we were the first two people there. And then um, from there to a family shelter in Peabody, back to the Boston Public Health Commission, and now with Elliot. Okay, and you're a recovery coach with Elliot. 
I am. And what what does that look like? Um, it, it's hard to tell so far because they've just started a new thing. It's called ACCS, which is Adult Clinical Community Services. Uh, DMH is changing the way the referral process is going to work. And it, there was a time in the past where if you were a substance abuse referral, they didn't want anything to do with you. Okay. Now, um, they're kind of under a mandate from the state to start taking some referrals because people are starting to, the school of thought, as you well know right now, is, you know, everybody with substance abuse is also duly diagnosed. They have some sort of mental health issue. So um, they're starting to loosen up their referral process for DMH. Um, as of right now, it doesn't look like recovery coaching probably the way it's done here because it's the overriding issues for a lot of my recoveries right now is more mental health, um, less substance, kind of uh, when their life is well regulated, they can just like, they don't care if they drink or smoke weed or do anything like that. Um, so it's different in that regard, but... Who, who doesn't care, the... The, the recovery. They're okay. not, you know, they're not... Oh, so they're they're ambivalent to any kind of a- absolutely okay, substance. absolutely. So basically, you're you're right now. If if I'm understanding this correctly, you're dealing with people who are basically using drugs and alcohol to regulate their mental health. Yes, issues? absolutely, absolutely. So they okay. get they get dysregulated from their normal medication routines, and then they'll start to use you know illicit substance to help, like you said, regulate you know their day to day mental health. You know, some self good self medication. Yeah, that sounds that sounds kind of like a tough position. To right, right now it is. Yeah, it is. You, you know, you kind of you, you you just go with the flow. Um, the one thing I am doing is I'm learning a lot about the mental health field and how it looks from that side of things. And how, and how does it look from that side of things? Um, they they have a lot to learn, <laughs> <laughs> but they have a lot to teach too. So I'll give them I'll give them their due. Yeah. So I guess. <clears throat> Tito and I had had are um, doing these uh, learning collaboratives with uh, BSAS, which is uh, what I, I always forget what BSAS stands for. The um, Bureau Substance, for Substance Abuse Services. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, otherwise known as Julia's Playpen. <laughs> so we're doing so we're doing a quarterly kind of. Um, I mean, the, the way Tito and I have done it, only because it happened by accident, was it just kind of turns into an open forum, which I think actually kind of works with the with the people that we have in it. And so that involves uh, a, you know a bunch of recovery coaches getting together once a quarter and talking about a particular topic and seeing if we can come up with some kind of. Uh, I don't want to say solution, but um, consensus on the current topic as it stands. And so the first one we did was on wellness plans, and this last one that we did, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah. Was on um, on how we measure su- success. Um, you had you had quite a few things to say on, yeah. on on both occasions, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on because you're you're pretty vocal with your opinions, and as am I. So I've I've been told. Um, <laughs> then they're probably telling you the truth. <laughs> and and, um, and I was going to have Dave Cave on. Um, Dave's and, awesome. Yeah, and he's coming probably uh, the next episode. Uh, we had a little. Um, scheduling glitch on my end on, on this past Wednesday, but on, on the wellness, I know, I think I know that, uh, a good portion of the recovery coaches at Elliott do use wellness plans. Is that? No, we don't actually, because, um, the way they were already set up, um, they use what they call an IAP. It's an individual action plan. Um, and on it, they list a lot of different goals because most of our recoveries are going to have a bunch of different goals. They're going to have goals, rem- you know, uh, geared towards their mental health and different things that are going on with their mental health. Um, and then they're going to include the substance use in with those goals and objectives. So um, we're not using wellness plans. Uh some of the coaches might use them as like a tool with their recovery, and it's great for things like that. Um, but since they've already got a solid a solid billing plan in place at Elliott, they stick with what they've always used. 
Right. So you you had you had some some things to say about the the use of wellness plans during well, during that forum and absolutely because I mean I think and I'm afraid of the fact that um, the state as they go through this licensing procedure that they're going through um, and as they try and decide which way they're going to go with it, I think they're going to use these wellness plans to try and make it a, a measurable gauge of success and. And that's a that I think is a big problem. Um, that's why both these meetings that we had they kind of seamlessly went together, and they were perfect because it speaks to how do you measure the success? And a wellness plan just isn't the way to do it. Yeah, I I, I agree with you, but I'd like to hear why. So, because I, I mean I'm going to fall back to the old you know old school peer-to-peer stuff that, you know, everybody's a snowflake. Everybody's going to get it a different way. We really, that really doesn't come down as a hot black and white well, thing. Uh, and it, by, by snowflake, you mean different. Different, right. right. Okay. Yeah, no, not snowflake, <laughs> derogatory snowflake, snowflake in the complimentary way with, you know, right. just everybody is different. Yeah. You know, not like Snowflake, like some of the people that you or I, I may work for. I, I, I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've been called a Snowflake on Twitter a lot. So. I have too, but I don't care. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so everybody is a little bit different. And so how are you going to get a measurable black and white scale of success? I mean. Well, and the thing is, too, is I guess I guess my, my opinion on that comes from um, really how I came up in, in AA and in the groups that I was in, right. Is that, and I'll, I'll just lay it out. I, I don't really know your, your, your background and philosophy, but I'll, I'll give, I'll give you mine and let's see where we, where we come together on that is, you know, I, I already, as, as an alcoholic, I already have a lot of self hate. Right. Right. I already have a lot of delusion. Mm-hmm. I already have, um, uh, a, 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 a very low measure of success for myself, mm-hmm. right? So once you start imposing something that I need to achieve, you're already setting me up for failure, right? Right, which is why I don't um, I don't like the idea personally when I'm when I'm engaging with someone or you know uh, when when I'm involved with a person to say, okay, well, you know. How about we get this done by so and so time, right? Now that puts a lot of pressure on. I, I remember I was yep. sitting I was sitting in on in an, on an IOP, and um, it was right around Christmas time, and so the whole thing was that they had to they had homework to do on how they were going to structure their time for the next four days over Christmas, right? <laughs> and so they, they all they all went around the room as to you know how their time was going to be structured. And and then the, um, the 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 counselor looked at me and you know she said so w- what about you Richard now I was sitting in on this IOP I wasn't part of this IOP and I just looked at it, I go I'm kind of a one day at a time kind of guy <laughs> and I try not to structure my time at all because it's all going to get effed up at some point right. and then I'm going to feel like a failure because I didn't stick to the plan right 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 and so so I have a I have a real problem with let's accomplish this particularly in the first couple of years of recovery, right? It's like, let's just try not to drink right. or use drugs. Absolutely. And see what unfolds and see how the rest of our life goes Absolutely. before we start making long-term plans. Yeah. And by long-term plans, I mean tomorrow, right? Yeah. The <laughs> only thing I can promise you I'll include in my day is I'm going to run around naked, touch myself, have a cigarette, and drink a cup of coffee. And after that, every <laughs> all bets are off. Everything's going to be what it is. Right. And yeah, and so that takes us away from being able to let these guys guide their recovery. And the whole tenet of being a peer-to-peer support and a recovery coach is like, how can I help you? What do you need to do? How can I help you do what you want right. and need to do? Absolutely. Right? Because here's the thing, right, is that up until uh, – well, <clears throat> up, saying up until now I think is a grand pronouncement, so I'm not. let's not use that. But for the most part in the clinical environment, it's people are used to having stuff done to them. Right. Right. I come in, I need help. The doctors and the clinicians are going to do something to me. Right. Right. You got to do this. You have to do this. Then you got to go to IOP. And if you don't show up for IOP on one day, we're going to punish you. Right. And if you swear during IOP, you're not going to be allowed back and you're going to have to start the whole process again and we're going to leave you to the wolves. Right. Right. 
Whereas on a, on a pure recovery, recovery coach standpoint, it's like we're, we're in this mutually. What do you want to do? How do you want to get there? I mean, my approach with people, and I still, I still get a little nervous that I don't know how to do it, right? I mean, I work as a supervisor now at right. North Shore Medical Center, and we were a little short-staffed, and I went down to the ED to, to, to see some people, and I hadn't done it in probably a month. And I'm immediately walking over there going, I, I don't know what I'm going Clanging to. shots off the rim because yeah. you didn't keep your shot yeah. practiced. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, you know? Know. I know. And, the um, and go down there, and it's the same thing again, right? It's like, so what do you, what do you want to do? Here you are. You're lying in the ED because you drank your b- off. And um, now what? And let's start the conversation there. Absolutely. Not instead of like, here's what I think you should do. Yeah. Right? Because that's what they've been told their entire lives. Right. Right? You're, you're a screw up and you need to get your together and let's do that. And this is how we're going to do it. Right. So this whole idea of, that's one of the reasons wellness plans scare me. Yes. And then, and then by association, the whole licensure with what you're saying is eventually going to, you think anyway, incorporate um, licensure to it. Uh, wellness plans and some kind of measure of success. Absolutely. To, and to, well, that, you know, we both game. talked to Katie O'Leary and Katie Katie sees how it works in that regard with her organization and um you know, they're they're going to make that stuff part of billing and that's that's scary because it, it's going to eliminate our opportunity of working the way we work best with a recovery. Um because like you say, you know, as we just went through the whole history of what happens when you tell somebody they have to do something and this is how you have to do it, it's, it's not going to be a good thing. So I, I think the state is going to have to step in and take a good look at it and really collaborate hard with these insurance companies um, to make sure that they're not holding up people's money over stupid things and, you know. I don't want to say a wellness plan is a stupid thing, but it's a stupid thing to not pay somebody over. Yeah, we get we get into kind of sensitive territory, and and absolutely, and, and the problem with it being sensitive territory is because it also gets into into murky waters, right? It's, yes. It, it, when when I one particular commission meeting, um, and so and by the commission we're talking about um, Governor Charlie Baker mm-hmm. had created this commission where Mary Lou Sutter, the head of health and human services. Yes, right? that's um, ran this, ran a, a, a commission um, to look into recovery coaching in the state of Massachusetts. And that can all be found online. It's pretty easy to find. And, and it's also on the website and we've been talking about it in, in a variety of different episodes and round tables. Um, so in, in one of these particular uh, areas, they're talking about licensure and they're talking about that one of the recommendations for licensure is two years of sustained recovery, right? But when the conversation got to How you prove what, it. <laughs> what is sustained recovery, <laughs> right? Right. Then no, it's, no one could, no one could address that. It's what you say it is, At, right? And they actually got nervous about that, right? So how? Well, I, I know, and, and so I would highly suggest now. I I co I co taught one of the recovery coach academies with Michelle Simons over at North Shore Community College. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Who was also on the show. Yeah, and she's awesome. And it seems like the state kind of wants to have their cake and eat it too, you know. They want us to adhere to all these CCAR things and the way Bill White laid it all out. And, but by the same token, you know, they're saying they want a measurable. And you can't. You can't give them a measurable on that. Even. On, on what? On you know two years sustained recovery. Yeah, exactly. Right, because because for some for someone recovers, I stop drinking, but I'm snorting heroin on the weekends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or I'm smoking mad weed, and guess what? It works for me. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, <laughs> okay, if you say so. Yeah. Um, it's not our place to say that that's not sustained recovery. So they're look they're looking for a a proof and a measurable that they can't get, and it also backs up to. You know, how are we going to discipline recovery coaches who um, have a, a recurrence? Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't use the word relapse. Right, right. Stigmatizing. Yeah. Um, I don't know why, but sure. Yeah, I don't know why either. But, they, I mean, you know, they're, they're focusing a lot. And, I mean, I understand, like, when you talk to people that you need to, 
you know, take some stigmatizing language out of the conversation, especially when you're talking to people that aren't familiar with it. But, you know, as, as an on the street recovery coach, you know, you talk, you're talking with your recoveries and your peers the way you always talk, right. you know, and I mean, dope and junkie and junk box and booze bag and that stuff's all in there, you know? Right. So, well, actually you and I were talking about, I, I asked you what your thing was and you said, well, you know, booze, but pretty much anything. And yeah. I said, well, you, so you're a garbage pail. Absolutely. And you, you know, didn't even bat an eye. It no. wasn't like, oh Jesus, Richard, you know, don't yeah. offend me. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the people that are getting most offended by it are those people, and that's okay, you know, I mean, I can change my language to talk to people like that. I mean, as as junk boxes, we, we've learned to become chameleons, too, you know, yeah. you have to be how you have to be in well, certain and spots. Well, and I think, too, it's it's one thing for, for, for you to call me a junkie. Yeah. And it's another thing for me to call myself a junkie. Right. And then yet another thing for you to chastise me for calling myself a junkie. Right. 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 I'll I'll call myself whatever I want right. to. Thank you. Right. right. Exactly. And and leave me alone. And plus, right? let's let's focus on the real issues here. And you know, at some point, stigmatizing language will be it. But you know, you've misplaced it on the priority scale. Well, and then you know, we're they're not you know they're. Uh, we, we can't call them patients because they're not really patients. We can't call them clients because they're not really clients. So we come up with recoveries and participants. Right. And I just call them people. Yeah, me too. You they're know? my peeps, you know? <laughs> that's exactly Where are you I, going? I'm going to see my peeps. That's they're exactly, out there. They're that's out there that's and, the exact term I use. Yeah, exactly. Know? Me too. And yeah. I mean, you know, around around your work environment, you use whatever. I mean, when I worked for MGH, they were patients, actually. So that's what we call them. I, I mean, around Elliot, they are clients, actually. So that's what we call them. Um you know, but to me, they are, like you say, they're my peeps. Yeah. They're my peers. They're my, you know, they're the people I'm working with. Well, there's a there's a commonality, I think. Absolutely. And, and I think that is, um, I think once, as as a recovery coach, once, I think once you start, and I'm, I'm not saying this is a kind of foreboding uh, warning or anything, but I think when, as a recovery coach, once, once you start differentiating them from yourself, Right as and then that commonality starts to lose uh, any kind of meaning. Right, then you're you're really not doing what you you're you were intended to be doing in the first place. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons I think you know, like an actual. I'm okay with the certification process now for recovery coaches. I think licensure is going to actually signal the death knell of. Recovery coaching as we know it right now, because you're right, it's gonna it's gonna pull that out of the relationship. It's gonna pull the peer to peer thing. Now you're the licensed guy, and they're the person that you're working with. Um, and yeah, I, but now you're the certified guy, and they're the person you're working with. Yeah, but they don't they don't look at that stuff. You know, I mean, do you do you think do you think it's um do you think the whole licensure and and that issue is uh. A money grab, absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> not where I was going, but um, but I, I I can agree with you on that. But I, depending on who you talk to, it is it's either trying to professionalize the role, or it's trying to on a lighter end to get more of a handle on who's out there doing what and. Um, can we keep tabs on this, right? Because right now you have, you have uh, CARC certification, right? Right, and what are there? Something like two hundred CARC certified recovery coaches in the state of Massachusetts. Hey, yeah, at at the moment, just a little less than two hundred. It's going to stay that way until they decide what the test is going to look like, right? Um, and yeah, then, and then you have people who have a partial certification. Right or went and took a certified course or something, and then called themselves certified recovery coaches, right. and start hitting the mothers on Marblehead neck for fifteen hundred bucks a month. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I think sober companions. Right. So so I think and and while that may be useful, um, I th I think part of the attraction or or what's attractive with licensure is that you start kind of weeding that out, right? And then there's some kind of oversight. But do you weed it out? I mean, you know. Well, there's always going to be. We're never going to be able to stop that guy from saying, oh, okay, so I can't say I'm a recovery coach. I'm a life coach. Right. And you give me $1,500, and one of the things I'll help with with your son's life is to 
I'll keep them sober. That's a good point. And that's the pitch, you know. I mean, people will always find their ways around crap like that, but I, I don't think that's an overridingly huge problem anymore. I think there's been enough out there um, in the media and in the news and coming from things like this and people like me and you that, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm opinionated and I don't shut up. So I take every opportunity to educate anybody I meet that doesn't really understand this whole thing. I try to educate them as best I can as to, you know, what it is and how it works and where they can gain services like this and not have to, you know, go to your pocketbook and pull out $2,000 to have some guy sit with your kid. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't really think that's a big overriding issue anymore. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, also, I also think one of, the, one of the positive notes or advantages to, to this kind of Board or licensing board or whatever is is the the eventuality of of protection mm-hmm. um, of uh, you know in the in the event of a relapse or occurrence whatever you want to call it uh, is is that person who is that person's license protected um, are they protected uh, is there I mean we we had a discussion um, we had a discussion in my in my office in my offices. Um, about a couple of the commission's recommendations around uh, self-care and all that, and also around uh, relapse prevention and things like that. And my argument was was that, so one, once I disclose that I'm in recovery, I'm protected under the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Right. Right? Um, so there are certain things that my employer can and can't do around me and about my recovery. Right. So that sends a chill through HR, right, in in a lot of organizations. And then we're talking about self-care and um, self-care in a way that makes a particular group in an organization or a particular employment group in an organization seem fragile and easily triggered. Right. Right? When I, I work in a hospital and in, and in a healthcare facility, when there are doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists that are also in recovery. Right. So why am I being more protected and more coddled than them, right, where my self-care is more important? You know, now people like Julia will argue that it's because we're thrown into um, – you know, a triggering environment, right? That we're around it all the time. Yeah. So, so taking in the five thirty white whale isn't a triggering environment. I mean, you know, <laughs> we we get thrown into that stuff all the time. Well, yeah, it, right. it, you know, go to the Monday men's meeting up in Woburn, and you know, I mean, it, it's I I think um, what they're missing on the whole self care thing is that. It doesn't necessarily have to be an organizational thing because I think, and I've worked for a few organizations, everybody's at the point now where like in the old days, you know, if you were calling in sick, you had to like do the whole pretend thing and uh, I'm not going to be in. That's not like that anymore. Anywhere, regardless of what you do. You know, I mean, I'm dead open honest about it. I'll call up and say, listen, I ain't feeling it today. I'm not coming in. (laughs) And that's it. So it's, I think it's more about teaching people how to be more responsible for their own self care and, and what that looks like and and putting some thought into what it looks like for them because it's different for everybody. I mean, but we should, we should be doing that overall. Absolutely. We should be doing that for everybody. Not just for recovery coaches, right? I mean, I'm sorry, but if, you know, if there's a, if there's a shrink that's having an off day, I don't know if I want him talking to anyone. Yeah. I don't, I don't want him (laughs) taking care of, you know, my suicidal brother because he's going to walk out of there and the first thing he's going to do is hang himself from the tree in front of the house. So yeah, no, I'm with you there. I mean, it should be a societal thing. Um, and maybe it is. Well, and, and it, you know, and it is kind of interesting that that you that that you went that way, right? Because I'm seeing that I'm seeing that here, and I'm seeing that I'm seeing that in um, in some of our primary care offices yep. and things like that. Is that the the recovery coaches being in, and the way that we're responding, and the way that some of these, and you know, I'll just use this term because it is a hospital, that some of the patients are responding 
to us, right? And the reasons that we're getting called in and the dialogue that's happening is the rest of the hospital and the rest of the care team is seeing that and starting to respond differently to people in our situations. Yes, they are. Right? So the the more I show up in the ED or on a hospital floor or with a patient that's been referred by a PCP office, right? And the more that's that's visible and the more the changes are visible, right? The the more we treat people like that as human beings. Right the more they start being treated as human beings. Absolutely. Right? It's like you don't you don't understand. They're detoxing. You've got them in a hospital room. They've been living on the street and under a bridge and on couches for the last two years. All they want to do is go out and have a cigarette. Right. I don't care what the policy is. Right. They're trying to stay here for, to save their lives right. for the first time in 10 years. Let them go downstairs and have a cigarette. Right. I will come and get them. Yeah. Right, and then you fight with policy, and then you fight with security, right. and then you fight with nurses who have stigma of their own. Right, and eventually, they all come together and they go, yeah, "Okay, let's just let them." Yeah, go. it ain't a big deal. Let's 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 let yeah. that happen because there's other issues going on that need to be addressed. Absolutely. Right. So you start you start seeing that compassion and empathy kind of filter out, it which does. which to me is is one of the, one of the biggest joys of the job. Yeah. Right. It's not so much watching someone get sober. It's watching other people treat people like human beings for the first time in a right. long time, right? Right. One of, one of the um, events that we had, one of the learning um, collaboratives that we had was on, on measuring success. Right. So if you wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and and you, you, had, you had some things to say around there, and I, I, you don't need to uh, go into verbatim what you said. Right. But... Um, just some of your thoughts around that issue. Yeah. So, and my thoughts on that, and I always, it's another place where I always get concerned because I mean, and don't get me wrong. I am not anti-clinician. I'm not anti-clinical people. I mean, I work with some great clinicians. I've worked with some fantastic psychiatrists. Um, I worked with a psychiatrist with Mass General out at the Revere Community Health Center, Dr. Murphy, who is without a doubt one of the best um, sud psychiatrists I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. He's just an awesome guy, and he gets this thing through and through, and he's old-school psychiatry. He's not just a mechanic with a pad. Um, that being said, they get awful hung up on terminology of, you know, measurable and evidence-based. And, I mean, I hate evidence-based. I mean, so... I have an ingrown toenail and I go out and I kick a brick and my toenail falls off and it fixed my ingrown toenail. That's an evidence-based practice that if you kick a brick, you're going to fix your toe, your ingrown toenail, but it's only evidence-based in that one, in that one instance, right. you know, we're not going to tell people, Whoa, you got an ingrown toenail, go over and kick that wall, buddy. Uh, we're not going to do that. And what they don't understand is because people are all so different my evidence base is going to be way different than your evidence base or the next recovery that comes down the line. It's not going to be the same thing. So you can't have a measurable, you can't have an evidence base. You can't have a scale like that because it's kind of pretty esoteric, you know? I mean, you have to judge it on the peer to peer relationship, how you engage with them and, you know, how they're moving along. And the only person that can judge that would be like you or I, because we're the coach that's working with the recovery. I can't, I can't have a clinician sitting there with a chart going, well, you know, two out of three days that you meet with him, he's, he's still stinky. He hasn't washed his hair, you know? So where's the improvement? And, and where is it? Well, it all depends on what you're doing with the guy. The improvement might be the fact that he would never, ever talk on the phone to anybody before. He would only text with people. And now he picks up the phone for me. Or he would never, ever go out and get a cup of coffee before. Now when I come to pick him up, he goes with me and we go have a cup of coffee. Um, he'll walk with me to go walk my dog. I mean, any one of a million things. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's interesting because we have, you know, we, we do have... Uh, 
we track certain things, calls and, and things like that, and texts and face-to-face uh, meetings and things like that, right? And I had um, I had a really difficult time, and you'll laugh at this, I, I think, at least I hope. <laughs> you laugh at everything. Yeah. Um, I had a really hard time uh, convincing uh, a, a number of people that the, the, the phone call part of it, that it was really important to track the phone calls coming in. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And they, they couldn't see the correlation. They're like, well, what? I'm like, well, that's hugely important because they're calling me for help. Right. Right? And that's a huge step. And, and I think what's confusing to me is in, in our experience, we, we know that, and we know that is a good thing because we've been around for a while. I mean, and around for a while, I mean in recovery. You're right. Right? But how does the how does the 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 again for lack of a better term how does the clinical community not understand that that is something important that needs to be tracked and that that's a clear measure of success right like all of the all of the examples that you gave right okay so he's not washing his hair but he picks up the phone and talks to me on the phone now yeah he goes out for a walk he comes and gets he, we go out and get coffee right so. <clears throat> I think one of the consensus is, at least I, I think, that we came to in that um, that learning thing. Um, you can tell how much I like doing those things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what Julia wants, Julia gets. <laughs> is that one of one of one of the the consensus that we came to was that uh, the the measure of success is really is is there an, is there a market improvement in quality of life. Right. Yeah. And in in uh, in social engagement, let's say. Right. Right. But how do you measure that with data points? You can't. Exactly. You absolutely can't. Right. So our our jobs are either screwed from the beginning, or we've made ourselves invaluable. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, to a degree, I always I've always thought that you know, and you know, all the different recovery programs out there, twelve steps, so on and so forth have all proven that, you know, the peer-to-peer is invaluable and not everybody can do it, you know? I mean, you have to be a peer first and foremost. Right. Um, You have to be willing to admit you're a peer first and foremost, which, you know, a lot of people don't. I mean, I worked with a case manager that was like, she was like, well, I'd kind of, and, you know, she's been sober for a while. Well, I'd, I'd kind of like to do what you do, but I don't know. I don't think I want to. I don't want to tell the clients my history. And I was like, "Did you don't want to fucking do what I do? <laughs> don't say that you do. Right? Um, you're just looking for a job that has what you perceive to be less work. Um, and that's a perception that's out there because you know, I mean, we we document differently. Our you know our notes are all different than what you know these ICMs and these case managers are struggling to do, you know, because they have to be a lot more clinical than we do. Um, And we are more interested in what I think is ultimately going to be our measure of success. We're more interested in in the engagement and how was the engagement? How did it go? You know? Yeah. But I, but I think, I think too, in, in defense of uh, what an organization might, um, how might respond to that. And this is probably a little hyperbolic, but if I'm having, a, or either you or I are having a good relationship with someone and there seems to be some improvement and our notes are very vague, like, you know, um, met with Johnny, support, uh, provided support and encouragement. Right. That's it, right? Um, that if I were to go out and get hit by a bus, there'd be no historical evidence or, or references as to where Johnny is with this and what our relationship involves. Yeah, point right? point taken. And I, I don't mean that vague. You know, you have to do oh, you do some, have to some of mine are that vague. Um depending on what the situation is for the day. You yeah. know, I mean I'll I'll put a little more level of detail in it on other days. Um I do try and leave a touch point as to kind of sort of what we're doing, you know, because I mean, hey, face it, I not all my recoveries are attending 12 step or um, reading the big book with me or, you know, things like that. Everybody's doing something a little bit different. Right. So I at least try and leave a touch point on that. Um, from an organizational standpoint, I mean, why do they want to see more in the notes, you know, because they don't believe what we're doing. 
if you don't believe I'm doing what I say I'm doing, I suggest you come out and ride around with me. Well, then that comes down to how do you measure success, right? Right. Because, I mean, I, I've said that too, and I've said that at larger meeting. If you were to look at my day, right, as a recovery coach, from the outside, it looks like I just hang out in coffee shops all day. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, <laughs> walk on the beach, take yeah. the dog for a walk. Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, a lot of people want my job because it looks like it's fun. And, yeah. And actually, to a degree, it really is, you know. That can be exhausting. It absolutely is. You know, it, it can, absolutely it can be emo is. emotionally, spiritually, and physically exhausting. It is. And I mean, you know, so people don't seem to understand uh, – Maybe self-care for us gets to be a little more because, you know, as peer-to-peer, -peer, we engage with these people on a more personal level. And people die on us all the time. Um, I worked on the corner of Mass Ave and Albany Street on a couple of different occasions, you know. And I worked for the PADS program over at the Boston Public Health Commission. And I worked in conjunction with all the guys over at A-Hope. And, you know, people got high in our bathrooms all the time. And I mean, I might go a week and not see anything bad, and then I might hit a week where I reverse five overdoses, you know, knocking them in the stall in our men's room or knocking them out on the street right in front of the building. I mean, you know, that's all. You gear yourself to deal with it, but it's still all little pieces of trauma that, you know, it's like the cloth sticking to the Velcro. It, it, it's there. It's there. And, you know, you might... You might get a little bit of a hardened shell to it, but, you know, I mean, every every week we hear about somebody we knew who died. Mm. It just is the nature of the beast, and yeah. that's not easy stuff. I, I, I think also that's just a, the nature of being in recovery. Absolutely. Right? You hang, Absolutely. Out, you hang so, out in enough groups sure. and hang out for long enough, you're going to know a dozen people who died. Right. Right? Right. And I don't, I don't know that... Um, I don't know that it's so much, well, for me anyway, I don't know if it's so much a hardened shell as just learning to accept that that's just the way it is. Ex acceptance is the key, isn't it? <laughs> well, I know. I, was, I wasn't going to get into that. Yeah. You but, don't have to. We but, know. But but it's kind, of, it's kind of like one of those things, right? And, yep. and I, I still remember the first couple of times that I, I had a couple of people that have been referred to me died. You know, it was like, are you okay? Is everything okay? And I was like... Uh, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what happens when people like me continue yeah. to drink, you know? Yeah. It's just and it has to be okay, you know? I mean, and for some of the people I know that, you know, everybody finds their different way of dealing with it. Um, but I know people that I've worked with in this business that, you know, somebody they've worked with in the past dies and, you know, they go to like every wake and funeral there is. And it's like, eh, you got to kind of, you got to think about protecting yourself too. Yeah. You know, and you got to understand that, you know, we have this cycle of life and, you know, ultimately if we can't, if we can't help somebody with whatever their goal is as far as recovery goal getting sober, then chances are at some point in our relationship with them, they're probably going to die. Mm -hmm. And that's just the, the sad reality of it. I'm trying, I'm trying to think because I, I, I want to, I want to talk a little bit more I I don't I don't know why or if we even should, but let's give it a shot. Um, in in order to so, one one of those that that whole aspect of success and all that, right? One I think is probably much like, um, you know, if you're anything like me, you've you've had to reevaluate your definitions of a lot of things. Oh, um, all the time. Happiness in particular. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And, and what, That's low on the priority and, list. I don't, and, I don't chase that. And, like. and what, and what that is. Well, I, I, I laugh about that because it's like, you know, people say, well, you actually look happy. I'm like, yeah, well, I kind of had to reevaluate what happiness means to me. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can say I'm happy, but it's nowhere near what I thought happiness was before, you know? You're right. Right. And, and your so, whole definition changes. Right. And, and the, the idea of success, right. And, yep. and, so how do we how do we align our definition, um, or probably more accurately, how do we ad address how, how do we align the medical and clinical community's idea of success more to ours, right? And and how do we how do we convince that um, behemoth uh, that we? I, th I think what sticks in my craw about measuring success is that in order for programs like 
the ones that we have to continue, right? They have to be funded, jump jump. and in order to be funded, they have to they have to show some measure of success. Yeah. And I think I think what the closest I've come to it so far is presenting the data, which was was knocked down because you know data can be altered and manipulated and meant to mean other things, and you know there's a lot of argument around that yeah. in that room. But I think if you can show clear data along with uh, anecdotal evidence yeah. to the people that are making decisions or responsible for making some of the decisions or will take part in the decision making, right? Then you there's not a lot of question as to how and why this program works. Right, right. And that's why, I mean, so it's up to people like, you know, me and you and Dennis and Danny and all these people we know that all have, you know, that all have a pretty good view of how these things go, you know, Katie and Jess. And they're, they're, I've met so many good people. Um, it's being able to translate that to the movers and the shakers. And like you say, the data, I mean, you know, hey, listen, I know social workers that write fake notes too, you know. I mean, people, anybody can skew data. That's easy. Um the anecdotal evidence is, you know, being able, you need to be able to communicate them and you need to be able to communicate it to the right people. So um, when you can get close to the right people, people that have come on board with this, you know, and the Sarah Wakemans and the Dave Munsons of the world and the Mary Lou Suttas and, and even um, Judy Lawler over at Chelsea District Court, all these people that they have those ears. So, you know, I think it's kind of our job as like the mid-level salesman to, you know, let them know how it works. That way, when they finally decide that this is how we need to look at it, you know, in terms of success, they'll have heard that, you know, yeah, you know what? Um, like, I think your idea of tracking the incoming phone calls is awesome. You know, it's it, rather than, I mean, but what they ask you to do is, you know, oh, contact note, you tried to call, you know, oh, called recovery left voice message, you know, and they're going to take that. And it's like, eh, that's bull****, you know? I mean, let's track who did call in. And that's one of the perfect ways. Right. Let's track who did call in. Let's track who got a job in right. the first six months or a year. Let's track who has changed their living situation. Right. Let's track who is buying their own groceries. Let's track, let's right. track market. Let's, let's be in, able to tell their story. Right, and, exactly. And I, and I think, I think that comes not only with the data, but I think it comes, I think it comes with stories. Yeah. Right. I think that, that, that the data has to be accompanied by, um, you know, whatever you want to call them, st success stories or, right. um, you know, uh, brief synopsis of yep. a particular patient or a case review or something like that. Right. And that people see, and 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 the failures as well. Absolutely. Right? And and why 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 there was a failure if it was a systemic failure, and it, or if it was an individual failure. Right. Right. If you want to call them failures, I know I'm probably going to get in trouble for that using that word. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I mean, but you know, for lack of a better term, okay, failure. I mean, but that's where we learn. Yeah. And and but but I think too that that the 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 job too inherently comes with some. Um, some easy way outs that I'm not really happy about, right? In in that, um, you know, uh, pr presumably um, relapse is a part of recovery, right? Right. So, right. You know, well, if and that was taught early on. I I don't think. I mean, listen, you won't you won't come to a recovery coach academy that I'm training and hear that. Well, yeah, you, you're going to hear that relapse happens. It doesn't have to. It's not part of recovery. It's not inevitable. It's not inevitable, <laughs> and a relapse isn't recovery. They're mutually exclusive. So you know, I mean, that's that's all crap. Um, Jeez, Mike, but I, I thought they were inevitable. Yeah, yeah, I know. In fact, I had a social worker tell me that in a meeting once. Yeah. So oh. when they inevitably relapse. Okay, so yeah. give me a date when I'm inevitably going to relapse. That, I'd, that was my I'd response. like to plan for it. I'd like to I wish, stock in enough gear so I, that— I wish you were you were in that meeting because that would have been two of us saying that exact same thing. <laughs> When's mine coming? Yeah, let me, give me the date. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. I'm going to stock in enough gear to get me through a few days. Exactly. Um, I mean, it's you know, and, and as an example, is I, I, I run a group— 
right? And it's just it's just a group, right? It's not a relapse prevention group. It's not an IOP. Right. It's a group. Right. It's you. If you were referred to me, you you come in on a Tuesday evening and we'll sit around for an hour and talk. Yeah. Right. And I get three to fifteen people in that group, depending on the week. Right. Uh, you don't get punished for not showing up. You don't get punished for not calling me that you're not going to show up. It's just here's when the group is. You can come and we'll talk. Yeah. I've probably got around a dozen people in that group who are either coming up to or over a year sober. Right? Now, you and I both know why that is. Right. But I have no explanation for it. Right. Right? I have no good explanation for it. Right? I, I, know, I know why it is. Right. But I'll, I'll tell you this, too. If, if a clinician or someone in the medical profession were to sit in on that group, I wouldn't have that group anymore. Right. Right, absolutely. I mean, they're never, they're, they are never ever going to agree with methods that guys like you and I would use to run a group and to not even have like an an outline and a topic, a and format, a format. Right. I mean, you know. And I went through that when I worked at when I worked at the detox at Cab. I used to do the morning goals and rules group, and you know, we, you know. Ninety nine percent of the time, you know, you're hearing laughter, and everybody comes because you have coffee. That's the only reason they start there. But then when you're there, people, you know, they check in, and it's talk about whatever you need to talk about. We're right. not, we're not going to stick to goals and rules because, listen, all you guys have been here thirty times. You know what the rules are, and who knows what's your goal for today? Just stay here and not go out and die. I right. mean, you know, we don't need to go over that stuff. And in the end, you know, we'd all be laughing and we'd be breaking up the group after 45 minutes. And I come out one day and the clinical director was like, I caught her standing in the hallway with like, I was like, what are you doing? And she's like, well, you know, I just heard a lot of laughter and kibitzing in there. I wanted to make sure you had, you know, you were able to facilitate your group and carry through with the format without interference. I says, Thanks. I says, next time I need your help, I says, I'll pull the fire alarm box. Go away. (laughs) You know, that's the bottom line. So, yeah, people would never agree with that. But you and I, because we are involved in a peer-to-peer thing, we know what a transmission line is. Clinicians look at you like, "Mm -hmm." you know, and then they hear, they see your methods. They see how everybody talks and how everybody interacts and like, oh, that's not a group. Well, yes, it is. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's how I got and stayed sober. Absolutely, right. It was just it's just identification, sitting around a table, talking. What's your issue? Right. I got this happen this week. Right. And then someone else will pipe up, and it sounds like they have been reading every Buddhist text since the beginning of time. Yeah. And you go, where where did he come up with that? <laughs> right. It's like that was absolute genius. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and those are the things that happen, right? Right, and that's that's I think that's the hardest part. It's like, it it's it it gets. What fascinates me is it it. It seems so difficult for them to understand that someone comes in, we get called, and we're going to sit with them for fifteen to twenty to thirty minutes to an hour, and either bedside or out at a coffee shop or whatever. And then that's it. Let's see what happens the next time. Right. Right. And and then they then they watch it happen. And then they watch that person not come into the ED again. Right. Um, and let's say in in this case it's not because they died. Right. Or they they're not back in the hospital as much. Or they're sober at their next checkup. Right. And things like that. And they and they start making the correlation. And then you have people who are important enough. And then, then, then the data points come up. Right. And this is what's going on, right? I showed data for August, for the month of August, um, at a recent meeting, and there were something like 328 encounters amongst four recovery coaches. That's a lot. <laughs> right? For the month. Yeah. So that's not 328 people, right? That's 328 encounters. It's, it's 328 outreaches. Yep. Uh, between the ED, the floors, and the community, right? Um, and that's that's what we're and they they look at that and they are these numbers right? Oh yeah, they're right. Absolutely, they're absolutely right. You know, well, how many of these were? How many phone calls? How many were texts? I have all that, right? And 
but what but what does that show really, right? All it shows is that we're doing a lot. Right. Right. Um, what what ends up happening is that the people in the hospital and the people in the in the primary care offices and the therapists and things like that see the people that they're seeing and they know that a recovery coach has been in touch with them and they go, Wow, this thing's really working. Right. Right. And it's not it's not um, smoke and mirrors. No. It's it's actually working. Right. Right. And it can be attributed to the recovery coaches. Right. Um, the the problem is is and I think one of the things that came up during that um, during that that uh, event, uh, the learning collaborative, <laughs> was that um, pe- people 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 want to see data because that's the that's the society that we live in now. That's the world that we're in. Yeah. Is data, 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 right? But we're we're in a kind of a unique position where we have we have the 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 access to that data, but it's going to take a little more, and it's going to take actual human contact and people in, interpreting and and um, interpreting that data right. in what they're seeing with their own eyes. Right. right? And sometimes I don't know what it is with people. Um, you know, I think we still have a judgmental type of thing too because, like, there's not a lot of people in this world now that haven't experienced some sort of peer-to-peer support group type environment, you know, because there's a support group for everything. There's a support group for, you know, mothers and people experiencing grief and, and, you know, people who've been hit in the eye by a softball and, I mean, you name it and it's there, you know. I mean, so people have experienced that sort of support and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I yeah, you know, I felt better after my wife died and I went to this group for a couple of months and, you know, I was able to work through my grief and I was be able to work things out. Um, they don't, you know, they don't necessarily, and they can only work that out with somebody else that's suffering the same thing they are. Right. Um, but they don't put that over. They still ha- there's still a moral high ground when it comes to the issue of drugs as much as all of these people that work around it say there's not, there is, there really is. There's always going to be a judgment to a degree. There's always going to be a moral high ground. So um, that's just is what it is. Um, that being said, they they're gonna they're gonna find out in short order that they're evidence based doesn't really apply, you know. And I mean, I think they use that terminology because, like you say, people have to fund this stuff. Somebody has to be willing to pay for it. Those people want to hear evidence based and things like that. Um, or if you're on an outfit like, um, well, like Mike Wilson's outfit, you know, I mean, the people that you're working with, they want to hear evidence based. So it's important for him to have some hard facts and data to back up what he does so that, you know, he can pay the bills. Um, but I think they're going to find out they're going to have to change their idea around what the measurables are. They really are. And hopefully if they see this thing work well enough for long enough, there'll just be a belief system in place. That's kind of, I think that's where we kind of got to in that, in that group. Yeah, right? a- absolutely. Was, was that, that, that it's going to be, it's going, it's going to be common, um, just common knowledge that this works and we got to keep doing it. Right. Right. And that sounds like a really easy out and, and a way for us to keep our jobs. But I, I, I can argue that, um, with no problem. Listen, I would love to get downsized out of the sud business to tell you the truth. I'd love for it to get to a point where they had no use for me. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. Cause that means we're looking at a world that's getting better, but you know, I mean, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Right. Unfortunately, well, yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, it, and it, was, it was another show. It was um, uh, Chris Alba. We're an intoxicated society. Yeah, we right? are. A hundred percent. And that's and that's just the way it is. Through a lot of things too, and I mean, it's not just. I mean, we talked about garbage pails. I mean, I'm the garden variety type of person that you know. I mean, it translates to everything with me. You know, food, sex, shoes, you name it. I'm a guy, if I have $100 to pay my phone bill and I'm walking into Liberty Tree Mall and I go past a pair of jeans that cost 100 bucks that I want first, guess what? My phone's getting shut off in about 20 minutes, but I'm going to look good. <laughs> and that's just how it goes. And that's the way it is. And, and you've apparently accepted that. I have accepted that, yes. Is that acceptance word again. That's right. So listen, we have, um, we've made it through a full hour. Wow. Yeah, I know. It goes fast, doesn't it? I didn't hear one jackhammer. 
I, well, there, yeah, there's there's construction going on um, at the hospital, so uh, I, and I think we got lucky. Um, it, it's right around. They must have broken early for lunch. So I'm going to ask you the same thing that I, I try to ask everyone, only because I don't, I don't want to leave anything out. And and that is, if there's anything that um, that I didn't ask you that you would that you would uh, you would hope that I would, and and if so. Um, no, I think we covered some good cyclical ground here, and I mean it's a conversation that's gonna it's gonna continue to go forward. You know? Yeah, and I'd, I'd I'd really like to have you on a roundtable at some point. Too, yeah, absolutely, so ha- absolutely. I love nothing better than to sit here and get tortured by Double D. You know, he's <laughs> just the biggest royal pain in the arse I've ever met. <laughs> and we actually have a couple other recovery coaches that really have some great thought processes and some really good ideas. Um, Tracy being one of them, she works with Dennis at the outpatient clinic, and okay. Uh, Casey, who also works in ACCS, and she did Recovery Coach Academy with Jen Mulvey, and she's another one that, you know, and she's... Jess, Jess Mulvey. Yeah. 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 And um, she's she's like Jess. She's relatively new, but she, you know, she gets it and she knows and... You Good. Know, she these, can, she these, can put voice to it. You are know? these people I should have on the show? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Let's set, let's set it up. And maybe we can even get politically correct, and you can have a a woman's round table. And we we have all women. Not all women. That would that would be hard since I'm the host. Well, you just I know it's hard for you, but you just sit back and let them go. <laughs> <laughs> it's that obvious. Yep. Huh? <laughs> on, on on that note, um, Mike Cochran, thanks for thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me. This is a real pleasure. All right, thank you. <laughs>